in third place and winner of the bronze medal, representing Canada. Auf Rang Nummer 3 und Gewinner der Bronzemedaille aus Kanada, Michael Wood. Welcome to the Cycling Magazine podcast. It's episode two. What have you got in store for us? Oh, we got some great stuff, Dan. We have two podium finishers from the World Championships, two Canadian podium finishers. We have Phil Guyman making a few Vancouverites a little irate. And he was absolutely not sorry about that at all. He was so not sorry. Not sorry. No, he, he goes full Canadian mocking us with the sorries, not sorry. There was a bit of that. And what else do we have? Oh, everyone's favorite segment, Full Send, No Send, to round out the I show. I can't wait for another edition of Full Send, No Send. All right, let's get on with it. Canada had a really good world championships in Innsbruck, Austria this year. Uh, at the end of September, two Canadians finished on the podium, Michael Woods in the men's elite race and Simone Boyard in the junior women's race. Uh, in a way, both races were very similar. Uh, it came to a group of four to the end, and the Canadians finished third. We're going to talk to Michael Woods in a second, but first, we're going to talk to Simon Boyard, 18-year-old rider from Quebec City. Simon Boyard, it has been about a week and a half since you were on the podium in Innsbruck in the junior women's road race. Um, how do you feel about that in the time that's passed? With still time after, I feel accomplished, uh, but I also feel proud of myself, and I'm now ready to to go on to the next season and uh, to look forward to the future. Nice, and I want to get to the future, but first I want to talk uh, just a little bit more about the race itself. In the finale, when you were riding to the line with uh, three other women, Laura Stigger from Austria, uh, Marie Lynette from France and Barbara Malcotti from Italy. How are you feeling about the other riders that you are surrounded by? Honestly, I didn't know them at all. So <laughs> maybe it's a shame that I didn't know um, Laura Steger because uh, she was the world champion in mountain bike. But, you know, coming to, to Worlds this year, I didn't know what to expect um, about the other girls, but I didn't know what to expect about me, you know, I, I knew I was in the top shape and I knew I was really, I was feeling really strong and all I was saying to myself was, well, if there's, if there's other girls stronger than you, well, they, they are really strong because I, I, I cannot do, I cannot do better in terms of shape of what I am right now. So um, it was hard for me to know the other girls and maybe it, it was maybe a mistake that um, I didn't maybe study, study the, the others, but yeah, I didn't know them at all. So I was just trying to look how they were pedaling and uh, how they were feeling. And um, at the end, I told myself, well, I think I'm with three other really strong girls because they look good. <laughs> There's so many moments during the race that I could have lost the race because I was not uh, the most experimented rider uh, out there so it was it was hard uh, for me to place in the 25 first k of the race before the 3k climb it was it was really hard I didn't know what to do in a big in such a big field because uh, we were more than 100 girls so it was new for me you know I most of the time I just raced provincially uh, in Quebec City and there's there's no there's not much big field as this so it's it was hard for me to place but then the first difficulty uh, happened and it was it was easier for me to just um, do a natural selection without having to, to, to be to try so hard. So you just do the effort. But yeah, yeah, I could have done a lot of things better. But I think it's part of the junior experience also to just do mistakes and learn from them. Now, how did it feel getting onto the podium in Innsbruck? It feels really great. Um, I was really happy to be on, on, on the podium, you know, because it, it's like a year of hard work that really paid off. And honestly, um, when I quit uh, Norway last year, 
I had this little fire in me that maybe I could do even better than a position in Austria. So it was it was an exciting race for me and an exciting preparation, you know. Like I said, I didn't know about the other girls. I, I didn't know what to expect. But there was a little something in me that was saying, maybe, maybe you can do, maybe it can do good. Maybe you can, you can do a podium. So it was really nice to... Um, and exciting to to train for this um, all year, and yeah, I, I felt accomplished that I could have made it. I was proud of myself, but at the same time, I was like, I'm at zero second of also being world champion. So uh, it was maybe a bittersweet, you know, <laughs> because mm-hmm. um, you're you're so close to to the win, but uh, also during the race, I was so close to the loss at many places. So yeah, it's it felt it felt good. You had a, a pretty good year, uh, not just in uh, in Austria, the World Championships. You are the individual time trial national champion, and you also have the national criterium title. Is there any comparison between, say, winning at home and, and well, also being quite successful on the road in Europe? Yeah, it's true. This year, I didn't I didn't race much, but every races I did, I had big goals and big expectation, and I was able to. Uh, deliver something at every races but i i know that in the future uh, when you are a pro cyclist uh, you race way much more and you can't win them all because it's it's just too hard my goal is to be one of the best cyclists in the world and i know the world field is really not the same as the quebec field so Every race since I won this year, I was like, be proud of yourself, but it's nothing compares to what you like to the world level. So everything, I, every race is I was just trying to learn something from the race and be proud of myself, but also take a moment to consider that it's nothing compared to uh, the world class. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now to, to gain more experience or to uh, get yourself... Uh, further into the world-class level athlete that uh, you're aiming for. Um, are you going to be racing more in Europe in the in the next season? The goal of next season is to just take as much experience as I can because, um, as we know, there's no U23 category for the women. So we it's it's not the progressive transition to the next category. It's, it's It will be really hard next year. You know, the distance or... The double of what, uh, what I'm used to be right now, so it, it's gonna be a really hard and tough year. But um, the goal is to be on a team that uh, will provide me with lots of races, so I can um, race a lot and um, I can take uh, a lot of experience for for the future. So I think uh, next year is uh, the first year of, of many years in. Uh, in my career, you know, in my elite career. So um, we'll see, yeah. Simone Bollard, we, uh, we look forward to watching your career as it progresses. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope my French accent <laughs> was not too bad. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's very good. Um, and it's also much better than, well, if I were speaking French, it would just be, it'd be a nightmare. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hope we're in touch uh, in, in 2019. I hope so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, take it easy. Bye-bye. Simon Boyard is a junior road racer from Quebec City. Mike Woods of Ottawa rides for EF Education First Draft Pack, presented by Canada. Michael Woods, welcome to the Cycling Magazine podcast. Uh, how are you feeling three days uh, out from Worlds? A bit tired. Uh, I still haven't quite settled down from my result at the Vuelta. And... I got into some pretty bad sleeping habits after the Vuelta, just too excited to sleep, and then just started to get some rest as I got into as I got into Austria, and we stayed at a lovely hotel, and it was really cool. I was starting to get some decent sleeps, but then uh, had that result, had that that, that result, and uh, if you did time lapse photography on me on Sunday night after my result uh, after the race, uh, you would have just. It would have just been the, this a dark room, and eventually the sun coming up in the the sunlight coming in the room, and my eyes open the entire time. I didn't sleep a wink that night, and uh, yeah, so I'm still kind of kind of recovering from just that, like a lot of excitement when I'm when I'm going to bed and waking up, and 
find that I'm not sleeping great just because I'm exci- so excited. You're 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 still buzzing after after that race after the world's ra- race. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, my initial reaction when I when I finished uh, when I finished the race was was actual disappointment. Uh, I felt like uh, I really with 300 meters to go, I really thought I was going to win, especially because Valverde opened up the sprint so early and. I'm really calm. I'm confident in my sprint. I actually have a decent sprint amongst climbers. And when, like with him opening so early, all I had to do was sit in and come around. And I went right when I started to come around, I thought I was going to win. And then I start had this awful, uh, just electrolyte deficiency cramp where I just cramped a ton and went from thinking I was going to win to almost coming forth and, I, I was actually legitimately disappointed, but uh, but that quickly faded as I started to kind of think about where I've been and how far I've come and the accomplishment of it all. Like I, I started cycling late, and when and before I started, I was just a, a fan of the sport, but I didn't really understand it at all. And uh, if you told me a Canadian came third at the World Championships. I would think like that would mean a lot to me as opposed to someone, a Canadian doing well at Liège, Bastien Liège. Uh, I know that a lot of Canadians just don't understand cycling, but they would understand a result like a third, like a bronze medal at the World Championships. And so uh, now, after you know, after some time thinking about it, I'm just really excited and, and just feel like I've been getting a lot of love from back home. And yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm quite, quite happy. Nice. Still um, buzzing. <laughs> still buzzing. I wanted to actually ask you about your post Vuelta recovery and slash world's prep. Uh, you mentioned that uh, your, your your sleeping patterns were kind of disrupted, but um, it also looked like you were recovering pretty well. There was pictures on Instagram of you relaxing on a boat. Uh, I don't know if that was a bottle of champagne there, but uh, is that is that common world's prep? Uh, yeah, th- there's definitely champagne. Uh, I my fam- my whole family uh, came to Spain when I was at the Vuelta. Uh, my parents, my sister, my brother-in-law, my uh, new nephew, and uh, they they the day they they arrived was the day I, I won a stage on stage 17, and then they went up to Andorra where we're residents, and uh, they stayed at a place up in Andorra and watched uh, the last few stages and had a great trip, and then uh, after. After the Vuelta, I went home and hung out with them for for a week and a half. We yeah, we, we one day we we, t- we rented a yacht, and, uh, splurged splurged a bit, and went along the coast of the Brava, and uh, went to the beach, had some beautiful meals, and for me, it, I think it was essential to having a nice kind of recovery post Vuelta and kind of an, an opportunity to uh, reset my focus and. Uh, rejuvenate a bit uh the vuelta is just like doing a grand tour is, is demanding and exhausting and i think uh you're really you really get stuck in a cycling bubble and having my family around especially my my nephew who's two months old now uh kicking around it, it was it was really nice uh, i i it made me give me perspective it took me out of the cycling bubble uh made me you know hang out with the people i care about the most and uh, i think that was yeah, super important to to me being ready for the world championships. I didn't, I still made sure that I wasn't overeating a ton. I didn't make sure that <laughs> I was getting the training in, but, uh, especially at this time of the season, you can't, it, the season is so long. And after doing a big grand tour, you, you have to, do, you have to get out of the bubble a bit in order to enjoy being in the bubble. It's uh, it seems to have worked for sure. And now, uh, uh, onto the race, uh, your teammate uh, Rob Britton at uh, at the event uh, got in the breakaway. He started really early, about ten kilometers in, and he was out for close to two hundred kilometers. Uh, what was his role in in that two hundred fifty eight kilometer race? So it was really easy to see Rob go into the break uh, because last year we had a cycling Canada conference in Victoria. And we even talked about it there, where uh, Rob could get in, would would be at the World Championships and get him getting in the break 
uh, would be really useful as that would be the best way that he could survive until late in the race and help me out late in the race. So it was the, the plan was for him to get the break and uh, when we caught him, be, him be able to give us give me a bit of a hand uh, if anything needed to be done on uh, those closing kilometers. And and it seems like he did that quite well. How are you, how what are your feelings on his performance? Yeah, I, I mean, he did a great job of getting in there and and uh, representing the representing Canada. Uh, unfortunately, when when we when we got caught, we went right past him. So uh, he was pretty blown out from the effort. Um, yeah, it's I've been in that situation before too, where you know you're in the break for so long, and then when the the peloton catches you, it seems like you're like trying to hold on, trying to trying to keep up pace with them. It feels like you're trying to merge onto a freeway with a moped. <laughs> And tell me about the role of your other teammates, uh, Antoine Duchesne and Hugo Uhl. Uh Antoine and Hugo did a great job. You know, they're 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 consummate professionals. They've, the reason why we had Robin was for him to to make it late, and uh, and we knew that Antoine and Hugo, although they're excellent domestiques, they're 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 not world tour climbers, and so their role was to take care of him while we're in the break and and just make sure that they could survive for as long as possible, getting me bottles, uh, and they did an excellent job. I had some derailer issues at one point uh, at about maybe 140K into the race, and uh, uh, Hugo did a great job. Antoine Hugo did a great job of just making sure I got got solved, uh, made sure that I was maintaining a position. Yeah, it's just nice when you have two guys that are are experienced with that and taking care of you and, making sure that uh, nothing's going to happen that keeps you calm. Now, late in the race, um, about two laps to go, uh, Rob Britton was still away, but uh, attacks started going, like uh, Van Avermaet made a move, uh, Pierre Kenyuk, Michael Valgren. Um, were you aware of those attacks from where you were in the in the, in the the group? Yeah, for sure. My, my, my race strategy was to... I knew I was on a good day. I knew, especially after doing the course recon, the course suited me so well um, that I wanted to really wait for the final. The, the final. So I used Valverde and Alphalipe as a reference point and just made sure I kept an eye on them. And if they were going to move, then I would move. But otherwise, I was going to sit back and just make sure I was in good enough position to just observe. And if anything really risky looked like it was going up the road, I could cro- I could cross um, you started dictating things uh, maybe 800 meters before the top of the climb. Um, how many people did you think you could shell when you were you were leading on that climb? I, I wasn't sure about necessarily shelling people, but I did the recon, uh, like I mentioned a few days or previous with Antoine and, and Rob. And uh, in during the recon, right when we started the steep section, I did an effort. Uh, not full pass, but a pretty so- solid effort up it. And when we hit that sec, just before we hit the section of the climb, I was feeling so good, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do the exact same effort I did in the recon, because I figured if I did that effort um, on that grade, no one was going to benefit from the draft behind me, and I, I, I was pretty confident that no one would be able to come past me. I'd just be able to dictate the pace and likely even be able to shell one or two riders. But I, I was really, I was actually hoping to have one or two ride, one or two guys still left at the top of the climb uh, in order to to build it with. And I, I was confident in my sprint, so I, I I wasn't super keen on trying to shell everybody. And uh, yeah, well, the way it worked out was just perfect. Like it, it shelled the right guys. It got rid of Moscon. It got rid of Dumoulin. Uh, not that Dumoulin was there, but he, he it, it distanced us even more. And uh, yeah, it was. It, I, I couldn't believe how well the plan it went, and uh, I was I was pretty yeah just excited when we got over the top and realized it was just through that. Much has been made of your uh, hill climbing style and its uh, connection to your your former career as a, a runner. Uh, were you running uphill on a bike? Uh, this time, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was so steep. Uh, on those grades, you just have to stand. And I try and I try and mimic running as much as possible in a, in that in on a grade like that. I find it's the most efficient way to get up a hill. And how was the descent? 
Descent, the, descent, the descent went really well. I was, I, I, my confidence in descending took a shake after I crashed into Tour of Utah this year. Uh, and it, it was not the strongest at the Vuelta because of that. I crashed at the Vuelta because I just wasn't confident. So in the time between the Vuelta and Worlds, I knew that final descent was going to be crucial. So I made sure to, to just, on every training day, go hard as, as fast as I could on, on descents and in, in and around Girona. And then uh, when we did the course recon, I asked Antoine, because Antoine's quite a good descender. He's, he's known in the peloton for being a good descender. Uh, I asked him to just go as fast as he could on the descent and try and shell me. And uh, I was able to stick with him for the descent. And then uh, after we did that, I, I even did the descent and the recon solo. Uh, still, you, you never know how Valverde and Bardet are excellent descenders. And when Bardet attacked, he attacked going into the descent, trying to, trying to rob me. Uh, I was a bit worried, but we got through the first two corners, and not only was I following, but at one point I even took a, a much better line than Valverde and Bardet in one of the corners, and I was like, uh, that's when I relaxed. I was like, ah, I'm going to be fine on this descent. I'm going to be with them when it, when it gets to the ball. And uh, did uh, Dumoulin's arrival uh, in your in your trio uh, raise any alarm bells? Did it concern you at all? No. Which just seems crazy now because it's Dumoulin. Like he's a mate, this guy who's won a Grand Tour, and, but when he crossed, I was completely unfazed. Like I, 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 and that, yeah, like I had a lot of confidence. Uh, uh, but the way Valverde and Bardet and I were working together, it wasn't. We weren't going slow, and so I knew for in order for Dumoulin to have come across to us, a he was dropped. So dropping the climb, so he was probably he was probably hurting. But then the effort in order to get to could not have been easy. Uh, so, because uh, we didn't go slow on the descent, and then we didn't ride slow after. Um, so for sure, he would do a big effort to get to us, and I figured uh, if he did, he, he would just gas and, and likely not have a good kick. And also, for me, I knew the guy to beat was Valverde. Uh, I've beaten Arday in a sprint to the line in Liege. Uh, so I, I just... I knew I couldn't fo- worry about those two guys. I just had to focus on Valverde. Last year, uh, I believe it was before last year's Vuelta, you said uh, to the journalist uh, Richard Moore, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you, you said something along the lines of you wish riders uh, such as Valverde and uh, riders of his generation would just disappear. Um, how are you feeling about him now that you've shared a world's podium with him? I want to vilify guys like Valverde and I want to hate them because of what they've done in the past. But then they come up to you and shake your hand as a human. Like you're not going to like, you're, it's really difficult to be like, no, like I'm not going to take this handshake, you know? And you realize that he's still a human being. Uh, I, I don't like how um, guys like him, Contador, uh, tested positive and never atoned for their sins, you know, they never came back and apologized or, you know, really, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan of how they carry themselves after their bands, particularly. They didn't own up to, uh, up to their, their transgressions, I guess. And, you know, I'm not going to let that affect how I race and I'm not going to be bogged down and use that as an excuse for, for losing to guys like that. Because I want to, I'm not like I'm a guy that wants to, you know, just win and 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 but not win at all costs. I want to be the person that wins uh, and does it the right way and sets a good example to to kids getting into the sport and sets an example to them, showing that you know you can do this the right way and you can winning's not be all end all. It's also being a good being a good person is also really important. The best way to answer those people is just do it the right way and hopefully one day beat them. <laughs> uh, Michael Woods, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Mike Woods of Ottawa rides for EF Education First Draft Pack, presented by Canada. Okay, full send, no send. Matthew, it's time for everybody's favorite game show. Yep. All right. 
Full send, no send. Give it to me. Floyd's of Leadville becoming the new sponsor for the team formerly known as Silver. Okay, first of all, okay, send, full send. It's not formerly, I feel the time pressure. It's not formerly Silver. It's a new team. People from Silver are coming over, specifically Gord Frazier as the director, and Scott McFarlane is one of the principals. Um, Floyd is a sponsor. Floyd's of Leadville is a sponsor. That has been... Made very clear. So Floyd's just the title sponsor. He's, He's not t- taking over the team. He is not taking over the team. That is correct. Um, for now, I'm giving it a full send until further notice. He's um, taking some of the money he that came to him after the Lance Armstrong whistleblower case. So let's see how it goes. Yeah. Got to be a full send. You know, that team's done so many good things for Canadian Cycling. They've sent one out of six riders to the pro continental level. That's uh, silver, yes. Yeah, that's silver. So no one else is doing a better job of putting Canadians to the next level. Mm-hmm. Now, this will have fewer Canadians. Uh, it will be a team registered in Canada, but it's likely, like, let's say there's 10 riders. It'll be five Canadians, roughly. That's my understanding of how the spread will be, but we'll see. All right. Okay. Uh, full send, no send. Going around the block to hit a certain mileage after your ride, like, let's say you're two kilometers short of a, of a, a, a century. Do you do that? Absolutely. Really? You're going to go around in circles in the parking lot? I think only an absolute crazy person could leave their Strava at 98.7 kilometers. I mean, to paraphrase Peter Sagan, ride is ride. Why don't you just stop when you're done, dude? Why, why do you have to have this odometer moment? Why do we do anything we do? Why do we go out when it's five degrees and raining? I don't know. For Strava? Is that why we go out? It helps. Sometimes It can motivate, but... You know, you get to those round numbers. There's they were presenting goals all the time for people as well. Sure. So I had a century I did a couple of weeks back. Mm-hmm. In the parking lot? It was not a parking lot century. It okay. was a real century. But okay. got home 159.7 kilometers. Ooh. How can in all, you know, that's Ooh. good in, in this world, leave that at 159.7 That'd just be kilometers? That'd like, be like a loose thread on a Persian rug. Exactly. But they're there for a reason. All right. Okay. I think we've settled that for I don't know if we've settled it, but... All right. Anyway. Big news in the World Tour. Uh The team known as the Wolfpack, Quickstep, a.k.a. the Wolfpack. They have a new title sponsor. You've read this team name. I've read this team name, but I feel like it's like reading Ikea furniture names. I'm not really confident in my pronunciation. All right. I want you to go give me a full stand on reading that team name out loud. Dusenik. Dusenink? Dusenink? Are you correcting me? No. Okay. So it, it's de Kunink. De Kunink. Yes. Oh. Well, they'll always be a deuce to me. <laughs> and you know what de Kunink does? No. Oh, uh, well. Yes. Is We're it gonna... something? Are they keeping on the, are they keeping with the, the theme they have? Quick step floor. They're linoleum. There is a uh, theme in terms of home improvement. Uh, so Are they like house wrap? Are they? Like the, are Ooh, they close. Are, Exterior of the house. Oh, siding. Oh, very close. So right from the website, they Uh are creating innovative building solutions for windows and doors and outdoor living. So they're solutions for windows and doors. Sure. Or are they just windows and doors? Uh, They're solutions for windows and doors. Okay, those are fine, fine, fine solutions. Okay, we might have time for one more full send, no send. All right, this is, might be generational, but socks over your tights or leg warmer. It is ridiculous. My four-year-old pulls her socks up over her tights. Aren't you responsible for what she wears? Barely. Okay, but you've got fly socks. Why would you hide them? Wear shorts. It's cold out. Not my problem. You should wear the proper socks and cover them. Do you wear your underwear on the outside? <laughs> I do not, but my underwear is no. not nearly as nice as my socks. <laughs> I say no send. Full send. <laughs> Okay, but here's my the real. There's two things. One, it looks great, matches your other kit. Two, tight. You look leg like warmers. a fool. You look the like zippers a fool. can interfere with the socks. I don't want my thread threads of my socks in my leg warmers. There's fashion. There's practicality. Full send. Foolish. No send. And that's the time. That's all we have time for. Full send. No send. <laughs> Phil Guyman is a former professional road rider. 
he retired from the Team Cannondale Drat Pack in 2016. Since then, he's been on what he calls his worst retirement ever. And actually, recently, it's become a bit of the best retirement ever because he travels and rides at various locations, sometimes taking Strava KOMs along the way. In September, Guyman was in Vancouver, and not everyone was exactly happy about his rides. On September 13th, you posted a picture on Twitter of a response you were crafting for Strava. It read, Whoever flagged this is a weak, jealous bitch. Not only did I get these legit, I have it on camera. Did you send that? Yes, that was uh, that was in response to a flagging on, uh, on on one of the climbs I did in, in Vancouver on, on that date. Yes, Your Honor. <laughs> well, the, thank you for reading that into the record then. Mm-hmm. Um, now, this so this was in response to the automated message you got. So you thought maybe that would get a laugh on the other end to whomever you were sending that to? Yeah, but I did have, you know, I had to I had to contest the flagging. I was flagged and it was it was, you know, it was a legit effort. Somebody somebody flagged me. It's rude. How did you feel about being flagged? I always think it's funny. It's I mean, it's a compliment in a way, you know. Some be like, "You're so fast. That's not real." And you know, my my answer is like I'm A, I'm not I'm not even that fast. I know a bunch of guys who kick my butt. Um, but it's definitely real. It's hard out there, man. People go real fast. I, uh, I, I was doing my best power numbers of my life. Alberto Contador dropped me. Um, so we, we, nothing you can do about that. We, we, all have to, we all have our own uh, you know, reality moment. And, and maybe I put someone in, in Vancouver on that. What brought you to Vancouver exactly? Uh, so Vancouver, so what I, do, what I do now is this YouTube show. So we were filming an episode there. Um, the, it's, it's kind of a two sort of a two-part show so i do it started out with worst retirement ever that was the joke is i'm i'm retired but i'm so bad at it that i'm still training super hard and and flogging myself up mountains and sweating and whatnot um and and then i'm pivoting that to best retirement ever which is kind of like a cycling travel show um but it's basically the same thing it's just the difference is that i'm admitting i enjoy it um, and I'm not, you know, doing this fake, angry Strava character anymore. Um, so when I am angry, you know that it's real. But, uh, but I don't, you know, I'm not mad if I don't get a thing. It's just like basically Strava is the context to like go somewhere and see something cool and, and meet people. Um, so, so Vancouver uh, Velofix is a sponsor and they're based there. So they have their, their mobile bike shops all over the U.S., but they started in Vancouver. Um, so, so they brought me up to show uh, Chris, the, the CEO, brought me up to show me the um show me his favorite rides in his town and and film a, a Vancouver episode so we'll have the the best retirement ever is is up with um with you know riding around Stanley Park and uh, Musette Cafe and basically just the you know here's here's what a, a nice bike ride in Vancouver is like and then the worst retirement ever uh, is a separate video and that's me going for the Vancouver Triple Crown which is the the three the three climbs um, the Cyprus Seymour and Grouse, in that order. So I went so I went and got the, those are I guess those are like the the three coveted Vancouver segments. There's one in the park that I didn't go for because I had enough. Um, but the Triple Crown uh, is I guess that's the that's the thing for the Vancouver Strava community. So I, I went and and tried to like the goal was to get all those in one day um, and and I, I I did. So it was fun. So. The kind people of Vancouver invite you up there and you steal their KOMs. Is that what I get? Well, I didn't steal them. You know, it's not really how stealing is. You know, it's a social media application. It's not a bike race. That's, that's part of what I try to remind people. And it's also not like a possession that can be stolen or that anyone's entitled to. You have to earn it. And somebody's going to take them from me. And, and I'm going to sit back here and applaud. Um, and, uh, and the, the way to respond is I'm, I'm going to go and, uh, I think some people just, I don't know who flagged it or why, but I think some people just flag stuff to mess with me. Um, which is fine. The, uh, you know, there's, there's Strava trolls out there, but, uh, yeah. So I, I mean, Mm -hmm. I, that is what I did basically, but I, I would, you know, no one should take it personal. And yeah, uh, you do a sort of, uh, revel in the back and forth let's say on social media even on youtube i think something i read earlier today was someone accused your video of lacking aesthetics and you Mm -hmm. responded with your face lacks aesthetics that's right 
So <laughs> you're no strain you're no stranger to this uh, uh, to the uh, lovely conversations that right. can be had no, on this the internet. Is, this is the thing is I've I've always I've always been a smart aleck, um, and it's gotten me in plenty of trouble, um, but it's also entertained me, and there's nothing I can do about it at this point. That's you know so you know if people are going to start something um in in whatever form like i'm gonna go right back at him and usually i can win that battle i've had that conversation with people like you you could punch me in the face that you'll most likely win um but but if it comes to the the internet trolling um i will out troll you the best one i ever did was uh someone said that my video or my humor was uh sophomoric uh to which i responded penis i was really proud of that i'm still proud of that (laughs) (laughs) that that has a certain succinctness to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not going to say it's not sophomoric. I want to look at the beginning of Worst Retirement Ever. In the first episode, um, in March 2017, you took on Palomar Mountain mm-hmm. and a KOM by Chris Horner. Now, in that episode, uh, there was sort of, um, you were trying to reclaim this climb from a rider whose credentials have people have questioned sometimes um and then there's also i think there was a local rider in your area who had a bunch of koms that people yeah so that was that was what started it was the my the whole the whole genesis of my pro cycling existence is um the the shortest version is i i I was done racing. I I had to be, that wasn't really what I wanted. I wanted to keep racing, but there wasn't a contract that made sense. Um, there's fewer teams every year. Pro cycling is, is political. Um, and I wasn't that good. I was good, but I wasn't that good. Like I, I remember sort of going through the world tour team rosters, um, the year that, that I was, that I was axed out of it. And I was kind of looking, I was like, I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. I'm better. I was like, there's a lot of teams that I felt I could have contributed. And then there's a lot of, but I could also look at the teams and, and, and no one was like, man, I'm going to need that guy um, in reference to me. So I was kind of in that boat, but I still had a lot to, I was 30. Um, I, I was, I was fast. I'm still kind of fast. Um, but basically I was, I was going to, I had a job offer at the time and, um, and I was kind of like, okay, I have, I'm under contract for another few months with this team. Um, my job doesn't start until, or wasn't supposed to start until January. Um, so I'm just going to go on bike rides and enjoy myself. And I was, I was working on draft animals then, um, my third book. And so I was just in between, I'm just going to go basically ride my bike for fun and remember what that's like. Um, so that included like group rides and, you know, just riding around with my friends. And one of the group rides in LA goes up this, um, this Canyon called Nichols Canyon, uh, in Hollywood, which I, I didn't really know any of the backstory with, with this, with the, I, I probably heard it, but I, I didn't pros don't care about Strava really. Like at least at the time I was on there when I was a pro, like we, some guys were putting their files up, but no one really? was targeting uh, KOMs. No, it seems like Chris Horner might've cared. I don't think Chris Horner cared. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think he cared all right. at all. He won the <laughs> Vuelta. Why would he care about a KOM on Palomar? Um, no, they care like they, they, okay. they might care enough. Like guys like to go ride hard up a mountain. That's, that's no doubt, but that's just what, that's just who pros are. Um, but like, for example, when I was training, when I was, when I was racing, my coach would give me an interval. He'd say, you know, do three sets of 20 minutes, um, up a climb. And I would do three sets of 20 minutes up a climb. And if I made it, if I made it 10 feet from the top and that was, you know, my 20 minutes, I wouldn't do like another 10 seconds to get to the top for the K. I would just turn around. Like it didn't move my needle to finish the segment or have a time on it or anything like, and and I think now guys are sort of using it to, to get a little more motivation and and maybe track their progress. But um, at least for me, it was, it was kind of just nothing. It was sort of a place where, where I think people at the time were taking it too seriously Um, to the extent that, that there was, there was one guy in LA who had sort of made it his mission to get all the KOMs in LA. Um, and obviously he's super fast and none of the local guys could, could beat him. And then it turned out that he had sort of a fake name on there and people sort of figured out that he, they, they connected the the name to the identity of this guy who had tested positive at masters nationals, um, for something and then was selling EPO on the internet and had been caught for that. There was like a FBI investigation, I think. Um, 
so not the guy that so so people jumped to the conclusion that he was cheating for Strava, which I don't I honestly I don't think was the case, but um, but that was sort of the that was the reputation and the story, and people that got out of the internet and the whole the the Strava world was 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 angered at that. Um, so I went for a KOM. Basically, I was just, I was just doing the group ride in LA, which goes up Nichols Canyon, and I happened to get like I was going as hard as I could, but I happened to get this KOM from from this guy. Um, and I remember like I had just put I had just sort of joined Strava at the time, and uh, and the the comments blew up. And all my friends were like texting me, like people texted me. Um, I got, I think I got as many messages for that as I did when I won Redlands. <laughs> like, was really like, dude, you got the KOM for Nichols Canyon. I was like, yes. Yeah, so what? Um, and but my my response was, well, okay, I have three months with nothing to do. I'm just gonna, if people like that, I'll just get all this guy's KOMs, um, which I did. I went and got all the basically all the LA KOMs over the next few months. Um, at least everything that's like from the bottom of a hill to the top. Um, I went cause this guy had it before and I went and, and the story became that I cleaned up the LA Strava as a, as a clean rider. I removed this doper from it. Um, and it, it got some funny media and, and, and funny stories. And at the end of that, um, a bunch of like a lot of my cycling relationships were kind of like, Hey, uh, we want to sponsor this. You know, it's, it's getting a bunch of traction. People are into it on Strava. And, and I was like, I don't, I don't know what this is. Um, I don't know how you can sponsor this. I'm just, you know, riding around at home, but, it, but I had the idea then of, of doing this, making a YouTube show about it. Um, I was trying to pitch like a travel TV show in Hollywood at the time. And that was a big pain in the butt. Um, so I was sort of like, yeah, why don't I just make it myself, um, and sort of do it, do it around this. And that's, uh, that was, that's worst retirement ever. That's how it started. For the most part, I think most users of Strava now are, they see it as what it is, which is just a social media application. This is where you go to express your, your physical life. You know, this is where you go to express your exercise and it's a beautiful thing for that. You know, like I, I get to share, like, I'm going to go do a ride later and it's going to be, I'm going to take pictures and it's going to be a beautiful route that like I come up with because I know these roads. And so I'm expressing myself with, with my knowledge and my fitness and, and it's a really unique, unique way to do that. And I think that's what Strava needs to become and, and is becoming. And then, but there's some people who, who are like seeing it as a stupid competition um, because they're, they're people who are scared to go to bike races or something. Um, and, and I think I came around at a time to that app that, that someone needed to be out there sort of hammering home those guys who were taking it too seriously. And, and, but for the, for 99% of the people, and that backs up in the comments there, they enjoy to see like what I can do on their local climb and, and, you know, people invite me to come out. That's that's sort of what happened in Vancouver, too. Phil Guyman, thank you very much. Cool. Phil Guyman is a former pro road racer who's in the midst of his worst and sometimes best retirement ever. Thanks for listening to the second episode of the Cycling Magazine podcast. It was put together by Dan Walker, me, Matthew Piaro, and it was produced by Adam Killick. If you're looking how you can help out the podcast, like and subscribe, rate and review, but only if it's five stars and you have something nice to say. <laughs> and if it's on Twitter and Instagram, we're at Cycling Magazine. And if you're finding us on Facebook, it's at Cycling Mag. Uh, and then if you want to send us an email, you got a question, comment, podcast at cyclingmagazine.ca we're on itunes we're on stitcher we're on google play we're on spotify and something called intune so no excuses not to download no excuses our website is cyclingmagazine.ca and this podcast was also done with the help of the ontario media development corporation we thank it for its support all right see you next time for episode three full send on that yes sir At the World Championships in Innsbruck, Australia. It's, it's good that Innsbruck is in Austria. What did I say it was? Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck him.